blend. Hey guys, welcome back to our accessibility conversation series. My name is Elise and I'm a licensed professional counselor with Counseling Care Circle. Today I have with me my friend Leora. Leora, it's great to see you. Hi Elise, how are you? Good, yeah. Thanks so much for being here and being willing to share about accessibility into your industry. Um, if you don't mind, could you share with us a little bit about yourself and your background and um, professional background and your experience in it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am a journalist. I'm a health journalist in particular. And I, I work in North Carolina now, but I work in the Midwest and in, in Philadelphia and also in New England. And so I've kind of seen the range of different things that you can do as a journalist. And aside from that, I was not born in the United States. I came here 18 years ago now. Uh, I am a citizen, but I was also an international student at first. And I had a green card, so I have all of these sort of experiences of moving through my career aspirations with all of these sort of phases. Yeah, wow, what a wealth of experience. So um, maybe one place that we could start, you know, is part of journalism, like you shared, is being open to new experiences, new frequent traveling potentially, since given that you are covering lots of ground there. Um, and having maybe sometimes some surprising conversations. So as far as accessibility goes, um, my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that journalists in a way set the tone for an interview or a story that they're pursuing, but then it's not just like they set the tone, period. Sometimes they need to um, be able to access the story itself. So could you share with me a little bit about um, you know, your experiences and some of your tips for people who are breaking into the journalism world and, and wanting to approach conversations? So um, I think the first thing you have to remember is that you never stop being human when you go out there into the field. So, you know, if you find yourself in the middle of a really small Midwestern town and everybody's really white and they ask you, no, where are you really from? You know, you need to be prepared that it can happen. And I have not necessarily found like the best way to deal with it. Like, I just know that my job is to be there to sort of get whatever quotes I need or understand the story. And so I try to sort of remove myself from that. But there are times where I, you know, go, go somewhere and somebody says something incredibly insensitive. And I just like, don't, you know, it's not our job to sort of correct people, but also you kind of have to give yourself like the right to feel uncomfortable or to figure out how within the bounds of what's happening, you can sort of speak up for yourself. Mm. And yes, journalists get to set the tone. Like I get to choose what stories I want to write, but then it also depends on what, what, my, what, what my editor wants, uh, mm. what the news of the day is. Mm. Like, you know, it's been coronavirus all the time for us health journalists and basically almost every journalist in this country. And, right. but you, and you get to choose like, oh, how do I want to talk about it? What do I want to write that would be helpful? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that you get to choose is who you talk to. Um, like I have made it a point to make sure that I reach as many different people as possible. So, you know, are my experts all white? I'm gonna try not to. I'm gonna try to find somebody from some other place and somebody who's maybe a person of color or, you know, because I just feel like it just helps the story. It helps the story and it helps you as a person. And so what ends up happening usually is when you talk to people who are different than you, you know, there's always going to be a situation where like maybe there's a misunderstanding or maybe you're just like, you know, there are things you didn't know or did, didn't expect. And the thing that you need to do is kind of A, be open to it, like you said, at least, but also just kind of like make sure that you see the person first for, as a person and not necessarily as a source, you know. Mm -hmm they're not just like a source for quotes, they're a person and they have their whole experience and also you are a person. And so if you can bring yourself into it and be like, okay, you know, I'm writing, you know, today about back pain and I've experienced back pain. Like maybe that's a point that I can say like to, to a source, hey, like I've had that happen to me before. Mm. And now we feel connected or maybe more connected, just a little bit more connected than we were before. I will also say that if you're a journalist, like typically, particularly in, in, in print, you will end up, often your first job is gonna be in a very small outlet. Sometimes those outlets are out there in the world. 
in the Midwest or, you know, it's typically in the Midwest. And it can be really tough if you're, if you're not of the majority culture. Like it can be incredibly difficult to end up, if you grew up in a city or something like that, to end up in a very small town where people just view you as, you know, some other. Um, and so, you know, mm. I don't know if like the best way is to just avoid these jobs and try to go for a job in a city. Uh, I didn't, but I will say that my, first, my year in Iowa was very, very difficult. And so, and I didn't stay there long for that reason. And so I just, I don't have an answer for that, but I want anybody who's going into their first job, if they're considering something in the Midwest, to think about that part, because that can be really difficult. You're in a new place and then you're also very different and people don't know how to talk to you. And then you have to figure out how to sort of educate them and it can be quite draining, so. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really appreciative that you're bringing that human aspect to your work and that you're very intentional to do so. That, that really resonates, um, even though I don't work in journalism, and I'm sure it would for others who do, that the person really matters. Um, so I'm curious, in your experiences and also those of your friends who are also in the field, um, have you found that there's um, support at work? Are there mentors or are there networks, organizations that you could reach out to to process your um, experiences as a journalist or even like a journalist in training? Um, are there safe spaces? Yeah, there are. I mean, you have to look for them a little more. Uh, I don't know if you know this about journalism, but it's been in crisis for a while now. And that means, you know, the newsrooms are smaller than they used to be. Um, people are doing a lot more than they used to be. And, you know, you're required to do like social media and take photos. And there's just a lot that's going on that, you know, maybe a journalist that was, you know, working 20 years ago would not have had to do. Um, although I don't know, 20 years ago was the year 2000. So uh, <laughs> anyways, um, and so you kind of have to go out and, and seek it out. And so either you have somebody in your newsroom who's like, maybe a reporter who's at the same level as you that you can commiserate and say like, man, this thing, this assignment really sucked. Like that's one level. And then maybe, you know, if you are a person of color, but you're in a very white newsroom, then you, you need to find another layer of support. And so it could be, um, there are professional associations. Um, the um, Asian American Journalists Association is one that I know of specifically for the folks we're talking about. Um, and they offer mentorship and support and they give tips. And, you know, it doesn't matter like who you are, things are gonna hit you differently. And so you might find like, for example, in the world of coronavirus, you might find that somehow it affects you more. Um, and so you wanna talk to folks who know how you feel and, and who can sort of like give you that feeling of like, you know, oh, okay, we are, we are on the same page. And so that's another one. Facebook can be a really fantastic source of support. Um, there's a group that I'm part of. It's a Facebook group called Rioters of Journalism. It's like, we're gonna include, include it in the description below, right, Elise? Um, and so, and it's, it's a group for women, but it's also a group for journalists of color and trans people and non-binary people. And it's really like kind of a, a group where you can, it's kind of part emotional support, part like professional support. Like people come there and ask questions about, you know, how can I get my resume better or, you know, posting a job or something like that. And they also come to talk about like, oh, you know, I have to cover a protest and I'm really scared or I, I don't, you know, I don't know how to do it right. And so, you know, and when you see all of these things, you think like, okay, everybody's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and we're all just trying to figure it out. And maybe that, just, that helps a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really great. It sounds like there's some official sources of support mm -hmm. and there's also some non-official grassroots people just coming together because they know that, hey, if I need it, maybe someone else needs the support too in the mm -hmm. industry. Um, so. 
I'm that that kind of leads to another curiosity for me. You know, you've mentioned earlier that you don't always get to decide what your story is going to be because there's a chain of command, which mm-hmm. is, you know, a feature of any professional industry and something that's understandable. We have to work with within the organization. So as journalists, where your where your pen is your um is such a it's such a personal way of expressing, but it's also such a public manner of engagement because it's your your job, your profession. Um, I'm curious, do you find that there is accessibility in terms of just being able to freely share on blogs or um, even in like zines or other print sources? Or do you find that for your field, mo- most of the contracts require that you just use your actual legal mm-hmm. name for your employer, but then anything else you'd have to use a pen name. Like how does that in terms um, of free expression? So that varies from newsroom to newsroom, right? It depends. Like if you work in a corporate newsroom, maybe they'll have like a policy for social media and they'll tell you what you should and shouldn't say. Like you can't, you can't just like talk about politics and give political opinions and that kind of stuff. Like you want to try to sort of appear as unbiased as, as possible. And, you know, journalists in some of these big newsrooms and like the New York Times and Washington Post have gotten in trouble because like they've maybe said something that angered people or showed that they are a little bit more biased. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it can be really serious in journalism. And so I would say sort of, if you don't know what the social media policy is to ask Mm -hmm. and, and then sort of you start with that. Um, And then for anything else, like if you want to do something outside of your newsroom, you can do like there are lots of folks who do podcasts or, you know, blogs or whatever it is. And, you know, it's great if you want to do it and have the time, like you can definitely do it. I find that journalism, like my my job is quite demanding. And Mm -hmm. so what I always sort of need to watch for is that it doesn't sort of eat out like all of the rest of my life. And so that I have time to go running and to meditate and to sort of, you know, ground myself because journalism is hard work. And it's really, really hard when you're listening to people. And sometimes they're saying really sort of sad things Mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, you can't, you, on one hand, you're a person, but on the other hand, you kind of have to think, okay, what information do I need from here? How do I help this person? Like, give me the information that I need, right? So it's not like just a conversation, like with your friend. Mm -hmm. you're literally sort of steering the conversation a little bit. So it's kind of like you have to be of two minds, like you have to be human Mm -hmm. and you have to also be this person who's going to be writing a story in an hour. Right, right, right. Yeah, so um, I I have another question at this point. You know, we're we're talking about um, accessibility within the industry for people who are already in. I'm going to just kind of take a step back, do a little bit of like a, you know, a big picture perspective. If somebody is um, an immigrant themselves or um, they're first generation, so their parents may not have worked in this industry, but they're very interested in entering. How is the accessibility, would you say, how do people enter this world? How do they enter becoming um, a journalist? Like so journalism is kind of um kind of reminds me of like snakes and ladders like there's lots of ways to get into journalism Mm -hmm. um you know it could be that you went to school and you got an internship and now you you work in the newsroom it can be that you fell into it like you were a freelancer and then you you know you you found a job that you really enjoy in some newsroom and you work there like there's lots of ways to do it but i will say as a sort of caveat is that the journalism world by and large, is quite white. And it, you know, it lacks the diversity that we need. And we need people who have different experiences. If you're an immigrant, you think about things differently. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've been able to sort of say, okay, you know, we need to think about this when we talk to immigrants, because I've been there. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, somebody asks, like, you know, there's an assignment about writing about like a, a holiday that's not of the majority. And I know that when I approach it, it's not going to be just kind of like, oh, well, explain to me how this is the same as Christmas or, you know, like kind of like knowing that Christianity is not the starting point. 
And so, you know, those kind of things, you know, that's really sort of helpful for you to have that, that experience, but it does not mean that in your all white newsroom or your mostly white newsroom, you're not going to experience people asking really, really stupid things or just making you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on how you feel. Like I, I can never tell anyone how to sort of navigate the, the fact that they're, you know, people don't tell you that they don't like you, but they do definitely like, they might say something that just offends you and you can figure out how to deal with it. Like I sometimes let things go because I know that it's important for me to, you know, care for myself. And sometimes caring for myself means backing, just like not, not talking about it because I know that it's just gonna be more upsetting. And sometimes it means raising it and saying like, hey, what you said, like it really bothered me and let me explain to you why it bothered me. Yeah. Um, and so when you enter the journalism world, you kind of have to be prepared for that. And it's a really sad fact. We are like, I know that I am from the inside sort of trying to change it as much as possible, but you know, there's probably not gonna be helping like your first job if you end up in like a Midwestern like outlet you might be surrounded by a bunch of white people who don't understand anything about you. And you, you are gonna to have to kind of work to build some kind of bridge with them and also protect yourself. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, that kind of, what, what you just shared makes me think of another thing also from kind of a bigger picture perspective is that, you know, each, each professional industry has a protocol and a way of doing things. And sometimes the way of doing things reflects a certain dominant culture, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's as cut and dry, so to speak, as just being governed by laws and codes, mm -hmm. so therefore it's a policy, but then the way that it's actually processed could feel a little bit cultural. Mm -hmm. So um, my next question has to do with increasing effective communication. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we have internationals come to the United States who have a wonderful reputation of being a journalist mm -hmm. or anything, you know, mm -hmm. in their home country, then they continue the work here, but then they're surprised by sometimes, you know, just kind of different things that people do. So um, I'm curious whether it's, you know, just cer certain like perspectives in the form of policy that you've seen that you're like, oh, that that's kind of, that's kind of American and that's unique and mm -hmm. it's like an American thing and, and other things that are just more about the way that collaboration and teamwork happens in an American journalist, you know, journalism world. Um, anything that you've noticed that you'd be well, able to hear about? It quite depends on the newsroom, right? If you're in a small newsroom, things are going to be more fluid, uh, you know, there might not be policies. You're just kind of going to have to watch people around you and see how they behave so that you can sort of learn or ask somebody that you trust and say, hey, how do I go about whatever it is? Um, and, you know, while it does sound kind of strange, you, after your first few years as a journalist, you'll learn that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Like you can be uncomfortable and it is fine. Like you're not going to, you know, you're not going to die of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. You can just like be like, hey, that was a really stupid question that I asked right now. Can I ask another question? You know, and people <laughs> respond to that. And right. so that's definitely something that I, I think about a lot as a, you know, as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So it sounds like a lot of it is observation and using your journalism skills as a journalist to observe to interact, to kind of read the room um, helps professionally too. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, like then you can say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Sometimes mm -hmm. it leads to some really funny conversations. Like, you know, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, necessarily believe in making myself uh, maybe less than to be professional or whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm just like, you know, I'll ask my, my colleagues and I'll be like, hey, what's the deal with Christmas? Like, can you explain to me this whole Santa thing? And it can like actually lead to some really funny and actually useful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, one time I was in a newsroom in uh, New Hampshire mm -hmm. and we were talking about how upset I was that uh, all, you know, the hummus aisle has, you know, sriracha hummus 
it really upset me because it feels like somebody just like randomly blended two foods together without sort of considering the culture that sriracha came from and the culture that hummus came from. Mm -hmm. And it just felt wrong to me. Right. And I was ranting about it to a colleague and he's like, why don't you write a column about it? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. So I pitched it to my editor and she's like, yes, this is great. And I ended up writing this column and <laughs> people really reacted to it. Like they really, because I was in a small town and knew who I was. And so they like asked me questions about it and they wanted to know what the best recipe for hummus was. And <laughs> it kind of felt like building a bridge, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's like, okay, you know, oh, hummus, what's the big deal? But it is like our peanut butter, right? You know, you must, you know, you must respect the peanut butter, right? So, <laughs> right. That's a great example. I love that little anecdote. Yeah, that's really fun. So, um, I think you know, for my for my last question, um, or maybe it's my second to last question. <laughs> Just giving a disclaimer because sometimes I come up with new ones while people are talking. Um, so at this point, I'm curious, what would you say are some issues that may be faced uniquely by API in your industry that are not shared by other minority or majority groups? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, your API colleagues that have shared it with you or like in privacy or, you know, mm -hmm. there's a pattern of them sharing it with you or even um, from like when you were a student and people were sharing about their apprehensions. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that might be helpful for others to be aware of so that they can then communicate, you know, and work together well? So the way that sort of I gather is that racism and bigotry has different flavors depending on who you are. Mm. So, you know, I, my parents are Latinos, I'm Israeli, but I look white. And so until I speak and you hear my accent, Mm -hmm. you don't know that I'm not from here right. and so you know what I might experience and what somebody who looks black or Asian experiences you know those are sort of two different things but the sort of theme that I've noticed is these kind of small um these things that you really can't like put your finger on but you just feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. like you know somebody who asks you persistently where are you from? No, yeah. no, where are you from really? You know, that's a sort of red uh, flag. And, you know, or somebody just automatically assumes that you are Buddhist because you're Asian American. Right. Or, you know, saying something about like latching on to just like the one food, like talking about like dim sum or, or sriracha or kimchi or whatever it is and be like, man, I love it. I love this food. And this is the only food I know about from your culture. <laughs> and it can feel a little, like I've been on the receiving end of that and it can feel a little like, I don't know, something. I don't, you kind of you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And so I would just say that uh, from what I have experienced and what I have seen, particularly when it comes to, uh, uh, bigotry against Asian Americans, it tends to be a little bit more under the surface. Mm -hmm. You may feel uncomfortable and you may not even know why or understand why you're feeling uncomfortable, but like something about the way something was said mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is that there's this expectation that you're going to be like really good and <laughs> go to sleep early and, you know, be this like really good model minority. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we all know that it's bullshit, but, you know, we, you know, it is something that you might like, people might make assumptions about you without knowing that they're making these assumptions about you. Mm -hmm. They might be like, oh, she doesn't want to go out on Friday night. Like she's probably asleep. And it's like, no, no, no. Like I like to dance too. Like we can, you know, so there's just a lot of that that you might have to sort of remind your colleagues and your friends about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing. I think the, yeah, I, I do have one last question. <laughs> so, sorry. Fine. Um, you know, I just realized this is our second interview, but mm -hmm. I didn't ask you last time. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wanting to acknowledge, first of all, thank you that you are participating as a voluntary, you know, 
free um, demonstration of your solidarity and understanding towards API during um, you know, this pandemic with the increase of racial violence, physical violence towards Asians. And um, that really means a lot. So thank you so much for you know, making your world of um, your previous experience as an international student and your current experience as a journalist more accessible to API. And um, with that, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, just like your personal reflections as a friend of AAPI um, in response to the, the mass murders in Georgia and the, you know, the really sad news of elders who are Asian being physically assaulted um, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and these terrible events. So just wanted to- It's been tough. Mm -hmm. It's been a really tough year for all of us, but particularly for Asian Americans because of the association of the pandemic, uh, quote unquote from China, which is, you know, not, that's not how it works, but okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a really sort of rich legacy of, of um, discrimination to Asian Americans that's really not talked about so much. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when you're sort of out West, you sort of feel it more because um, you know, California has had sort of a, a, a huge influx of immigrants. And so they had a lot of sort of really racist practices to try to sort of curtail uh, folks. But, you know, I just, every time I sort of see these things, no matter who the group is, I feel sort of really ashamed and awful for this country that is mine now, yeah. that I have, you know, I call it home. And, you know, I, as an immigrant who's now a citizen, I take responsibility for it. Like we don't have any other choice. There's nothing else that we can do, but say this shouldn't happen. And that it is happening, like maybe we can't stop everything, but I, in my little world, I will stop whatever it is that I can't stop. When somebody says something that's insensitive, I'm just gonna be using my white privilege and being like, hey, no, no. And, you know, in hopes that it makes a better world. I think my, my feelings matter less in this. Like I think the feelings of API folks matter more in this situation than my feelings. I just want in my little world to feel like I am doing everything I can to advance these causes because I don't know how else we will sort of move forward. The United States was never a white country, but you know, it was, it was ruled by white people. Um, and, you know, I think it's, there's time, it's time and it's been time for a long time for more people to be at the table. And unfortunately, when, you know, when we make one step forward, somebody finds a way to make one step back. And so that's where we are right now, but I don't think it's forever. I think we're gonna figure this out. I think my generation and the younger generation, like we are, Sort of moving forward towards sort of being more understanding and maybe that doesn't help a lot of people like right now right this moment but like a lot of us are thinking about it and a lot of us are trying different things and so you know if all of us try different things hopefully hopefully we can kind of beat this thing mm, yeah well thank you so much for your for your heart and your intention and, and for showing up and having this conversation with me i have so enjoyed getting to know more about your professional background and and also, you know, building this, this friendship with you through my cousin. So just been really wonderful. Thank you again. Same, and, same. Yeah, yeah. And with that, I look forward to getting to know you more off camera <laughs> with my cousin. <laughs> and um, for at least this, this conversation, thank you again. And we will close this interview. Bye, guys.